into existence? Oh. Uh, Where does it come from? Started with a picture, a graph, and a curve. Okay. What are we trying to find? Or no, instantaneous. The instantaneous rate of change, whatever the two variables are, the one variable to the other. Translates to what about the graph? Uh, the slope. Yeah, the slope. Okay, so we're using those two points to find the slope. Yeah. Okay, so can you <coughs> that to a picture that? Like why? Like the slope and the formula? Just like we're trying to find the slope of a line, right? Yeah. It goes to those two points. Yeah. So just give us a line that goes to those two points. Oh, okay. So sketch a line. So, so we're trying to find the slope of that line to start with, and then we're going to go point to point. Okay. Right? All right. Agreed? Yeah. Okay. So show us how it's done. So find the slope would be 2 over 3. Okay, I can talk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My phone is about to die. That's bad. Y2 over. It's a mirror. No, Y2 minus Y1 over. Y2 minus Y1. Yeah. What's, what's, the, what's the two and the three and the four? Oh, those are the points. Okay. Uh, we have to be kind of not specific. Right? We we're not going to develop this f of x plus h minus f of x over h thing by plugging numbers. These numbers are going to stay numbers. So how do we translate this picture into and then wrote some stuff up there, and eventually we got to oh, that, yeah. right? It's, uh, is it the difference in x and the difference in y? That yeah, that's the slope, right? The, that's what slope is, is, is the change in y over the change in x. Yeah. Delta y over delta x. And so, yeah, we're getting there. That's where this thing is born, right? It's where it starts to take shape. Uh, 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 Show us where where's x. Okay, so this would be what's delta x? X. And this would be here to here would be the change in x. Okay, so that's your run. Yeah. If you ride over your run, that's the horizontal, that's the run. Okay? Yeah. That's delta x. Yeah. So what is and this would be x plus delta x. Okay, so that's the place on the x-axis that you start at x and you go over a little bit.
So then, what's this guy here? Um, this would be fx plus the chain in x. So it would be like. What do you say? What's what's this guy here? F of x plus delta x. It's a y value, right? That's how we we know it's a y value because it's f of something. Okay. So it's y value of what? <laughs> okay. So it's the it's the y value at what place? Of at x plus delta x. There's x plus delta, delta x right there, say. And the y value of that x position right there is f of x plus f of x. Okay, when we talk about the slope, what's, what's the formula for this? Well, that's the slope intercept form of the equation of a line. What's up? Is it delta y over delta? Delta y over delta x, okay, so that is a, like a definition. It's a little less formulaic, like it doesn't tell me what things to put where, right? So y2 minus right. y1 over x2 minus x1. So this is a y value. Which y value do we treat this like? It's y2. y2, okay, so what's y1? Uh, oh, no. Love x, right? Love x, right? Love y value. So what, you know, what do we do with that f of x then? Uh, we subtract it. Okay, so there we go. Subtract it. That's like y2 minus y1. minus x1. So that'd be right. Which makes sense, yeah. right? If I take this point and I take this point and I subtract, what I'll have is what I've defined as the distance between the two. Alright, so and then so would these basically become our h's? Yeah, we call them h y yeah. because delta x is the nominal yeah. description. So then What I wanted. That's it. And you did it. And that's, that's what I was asking for. Oh, okay. So good job. Very good. Very good. Do that. Okay. So let me ask you this. This is kind of a like what you would see at an EP test. Let me ask you this question. Um, Don't worry about trying to figure that out because we don't have the tools yet. But what information, if I could evaluate this and I could let this go to zero, what information would that give me? What would that tell me? Okay, the change in y over the change in x of. Of the slope is like saying the, the slope of the slope. Yes. Right? So the change in y over the change in x of the graph. The graph of what? Sine. Sine. Sine of what? Sine of x. Okay. It would tell me the change in y over the change in x, the slope of the graph sine of x, where? Uh, and they want you to deduce that kind of information. This is a kind of a, a question you would see on the, uh, the AP test. They will say, what is the limit as h approaches zero of this thing? And you'll think, oh my gosh, I don't know. I don't know how to get those h's to cancel. Remember how we got those h's to cancel last class? How do we do that? What do you really do? You recognize that what they're looking for is the slope of the tangent line, and given future skills that will develop will be able to do that right? in a different way, other than taking the limit. Right? Other than taking the limit, we'll have other ways 
identify the slopes of uh, graphs of two points. Before we can do that with much freedom and, and skill, we need to study up on it. We need to be able to evaluate limits. Okay? So first we need to talk about what is a limit. If I understand correctly, you guys talked about that. What a limit is. In free time. Maybe in the last two days of the year. Yeah. Last two days? Oh, yeah, not very. Okay, so that be the case. So we'll start by looking at graphs. So which hope that but I haven't used it for a little bit. Look at a couple of functions. Let's look at A quick work of this. Let's talk about what is this function worth at four. Okay. Now let's look at this other function. So first we'll do x plus 2. What will this look like? It's a line. It's a line. Mm -hmm. Y equals mx plus b, right? Okay. There it is. Y intercept of 2, slope of 1. Let's go over here and now put in this function. x squared minus 2x minus 8. Got it. Divided by... curvy 
thing, or maybe a, an asymptote or something. Going along the line. Oh wait, are here? Uh, last here. Let's go along there. What? Let's see. Let's turn off this guy and have it draw the one that we just did. So if I press enter there and it's not black, then it won't draw that. It'll just redraw the second one. I thought I just turned that one off. What is this? This guy, right? I turned off x plus two. So now this graph looks a whole lot like y equals x plus two. Right? Hmm. Strange. Uh, let's see. Let's put in something else that doesn't have a problem. Let's put three into this function. What do we get in this function? We put three in. Five. Okay. Let's put three into this function. Let's see what we. Get out of this function? Five. Five. Here, let's get these different names. We can keep track of these things. Like a G, an F. And let's track some stuff like X, F of X, and G of X. Just put in a four. Here we got six. Here we got undefined. And then we put in uh, three just now. We got five. We also got five here. Okay. Put in uh, four. No, not four. Let's put in five. Let's go on the other side. Seven there. Okay. Five gives us seven. How about five in this one? Seven. Oh, okay. Twenty-five minus ten minus eight. Get fifteen minus eight is seven over one, which is. Well, when you put in four, we get two different things. But when you put in three, we get five. When you put in five, we get seven. What do you think will happen if we put in eight to here? Ten. Ten. <laughs> what do you think we'll get for G? I think the same thing. Why do you think it's the same thing? It's because it's a pattern. It's just a trend. Okay. Well, it has been a trend and will continue to be a trend. And everything I put in here. Will, be, will get out the exact same thing as if I put the same thing in here, except what I put in four. Oh, so that would four be like the limit? Well, this helps us talk about limits because here we want to look at what's G of four. Let's talk about that. What is it? Undefined, it doesn't exist. But what is the limit? as x approaches 4 of g of x. It is 6. Okay? And we'll use that method a little bit later. But what I want you to see is that if we keep getting closer and closer and closer to 4, this function here, what do you think we'll get? We'll get numbers out, and those numbers will be close to 6. Oh, 6. six. And if we go on one side or the other, some will be smaller than six, some will be bigger than six, but the closer we get to four on the right and on the left, we'll just get closer and closer and closer to six. Okay? Now, this function does not exist at four, but its limit does exist. It does have a limit. It does approach the same number from the left and the right. Okay? That's all it takes. Okay? It doesn't look like there's any issue. I've turned off x plus 2 again. It doesn't look like it has any issue. It looks fine. And no matter how far I zoom in on this graph, it'll still look fine. Okay? Because that, quote, hole at 4 is infinitely small. So there is a theoretical gap there. So as we look at limits, we want to talk about, um, let's grab a
this is the graph of x squared minus 2x huh? minus 8 over x minus 4. We want to look what's happening as we get close to 4. When we look here at 4, there's in reality a hole. So we're looking what happens as we come from the left and from the right towards that x value. What y value do we get really close to? It's a really simple definition. So really quickly, let me just draw some graphs. Let's say that's two. Call this bad. Let me just ask you, does the limit as x approaches approaches two of f of x exist? What is this question? Right. It's not three? It's got what? It's got a point. It's got a point on it? What do you mean by that? It's got like plus and it's not a function one is three, not one and three. It's filled in here. It's filled in here. Yeah. We're already out of the tent. There is a place for that line to go through there. Okay. Not a possible point for it to go at one. Are you saying that to have a limit you have to have a gap? Yeah. No. no. Not not true. So that like uh, if we look at this graph, we can call this two, we can call this five, whatever you want to call it. Does the limit as x approaches two exist? Yes. It does. I mean as long as I keep getting closer and closer and closer to a given y value. As I move in from the left to the right, then yeah, I've got a limit. Okay? Even if there's not a limit. But you're right to say that the limit as x approaches 2 of this function it is 1. Because if I were to put in some x values to the right of 2, like 2.5, and 2.1, and 2.0, 0, 0, 0, 1, I'm going to get numbers like 1.1, 1.1. 0, 1, 1. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. What about on this side? If I were to plug in numbers that are less than 2, like 0. 0.5, 0. 0.9, 0. 0.999, 0. 0.9999, what kind of numbers am I going to get when I put in 0. 0.99999 into this function? It's going to, what, oh, if I put 1.9, sorry, 1.9999 into this function, you're going to get like 0. 0.9. So that's the basic definition of a limit graphically. Okay. Um, got this. What's the limit as x? Why doesn't this exist? From the left, it's approaching two, and from the right, it's approaching one. Right. I put numbers in that are closer and closer and closer to two. I just keep getting numbers that are closer and closer and closer to two. If I put in numbers that are a little bit bigger than two, I'll just keep getting numbers that are a little bit bigger than one. From here, it's approaching two, and from here, it's approaching one. And since they're not trying to meet up, they're not approaching the same y value, we have no limit. The limit does not exist. So what I want you to do uh, to start with is look on page 55 and the numbers 9 through 16, I want you to find each of those limits. We have eight problems. It's just a matter of writing down a number. So on your homework, so you may want to go to this part of your homework.
paper. I don't know. So, limit basics, it doesn't get much more basic than looking at a graph, okay, that helps us visualize it. Uh, so, if I take my two fingers and I, I try to approach the x value, okay, be careful you don't fall for the trick of, uh, you know, like there's a, there's a, is there a hole there or is there a gap there? I I see it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if I were the writer of this question, I could try to trick you and say, what's the limit as x approaches 2? <laughs> Right. What I want you to do with your approach two, or a picture tricks you into doing is looking at three. Okay. So just make sure you're paying attention to where I want you to get close to. So as x approaches three, what is the limit of this function? Right, we go this way, we come in from the right, we're getting close to a y value of one. We come in from the left, we get close to a y value of one. If I put in 3.5, Excuse me, 3.5 is going to give me a half. 3.25 is going to probably give me 0 0.75. 3.00001 is probably going to give me something like what? 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.00001. Something like that. Right. Something like that, yeah? Okay. If I put in 2.99999, I'll get something like. Right. A bunch of zeros and then a sum. Yeah. So, in that case, I'll, in some some cases I'll get numbers that are less than one. Some I'll get that are bigger than one. But no matter what I do, the closer I get to putting in a number that is three, the closer I get a y value that is what closer, closer and closer and closer it gets to one. Okay. And that's another way we're going to evaluate, evaluate limits. It's numerically that's using basically a table, putting in things for x and seeing what comes out for y. Okay, uh, how about this one? Does this have a limit as x approaches 1? Yeah. Yes. Yeah? Is this a dot or a dot? Dot. Dot, okay. As I approach from the right, I get y values that are close to 3. And as I approach from the left, I get y values that are close to 3 as well. Okay, now here, still the question is what value, y value, am I getting closer and closer and closer? Closer, infinitely close to two. Okay. Clearly, they're trying to teach you something by tricking you into answering what? Zero. They want you to answer zero if you're not fully understanding where the limit is. The limit is what y value we're we getting close to as we put in values that are close to two. Put in an x that's close to two, you get out a y that's close to two. Put in an x that's close to two on the left side, you still get a value of y that is close to two. Here, I'm going to make sure the limit as x approaches 1. Okay, that's where I am. As I come from the left, I approach what? 3. And as I approach from the right, I get three. something close to 3. Not 1. I don't get 1. Even though, what is this? One. It's 1. Okay. It's not 3. Okay. If I actually put in the number 1, well, let's see. I want to put 1 into the function, so I kind of have to consult my little chart. Which, which function do I use? Uh, well, x is equal to 1. It's not not equal to 1, it is equal to 1. So when x is equal to 1, what's my y value? It's just simply 1. We don't do anything. Okay? This we call a piecewise function. Okay? You guys familiar with piecewise function? Sure. Well, these are piecewise functions. If I give you a, a few different functions, I just have to tell you which x values correspond to which functions. They're not a tricky thing. We know how to put things into functions, right? piecewise function just kind of divides up the x into different regions and says, these x's go into that function, these x's go into some other function. We could do three functions, these other x's go into this third function. We could do four, five, an infinite number of functions in a piecewise function. Okay, we come down here. We want to make sure we're not getting tricked here. x approaches five, that is the x value we're talking about right there. If I come from the right, I get values that are closer and closer and closer to one. And in fact, it looks like they're not even close to one, they are one. And over here, y values I get are, are negative. So the limit is when they approach the same value. What do we have here? Yeah. We'll come to call these a right hand limit and a left hand limit. Okay? And another way to talk about limits is that the 
right hand limit and the left hand limit don't equal each other, don't equal the same number, then we have no official limit. Official limit is this side. Okay, this guy, your, your book has a nice little dotted line, I think. Right? Yeah, it yeah. Okay, we're on number 14 here, and uh, from the right, as I get close to three, right? We're approaching three, that's correct. This keeps going like this. Like, so if I put in three and a half, what kind of a number will I get? But if I put in 0.25, how's that number compared? Bigger, like, looks like I'm gonna get something like that. If I put in 0.1, it's way up there. It's, it's a huge number, right? And as I get closer to three, what kind of numbers am I getting? Infinitely big. You want a big number? I can give you as big a number as you want by putting in a number that's really close to three. Right? A really big number in the negative direction? I can just come in on this other side of three, right? Put in something like 2.99999, what will I get? Something way far negative, exactly. And it just keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps going. Right? We will eventually come to say things that are like the limit is infinity and the limit is negative infinity. That's kind of a silly thing to say, right? Because the limit is about getting close to a number, Can you get close to infinity. No matter how close you get, the end of it is infinitely far away from you. It's kind of a silly idea, but we will say that. That's kind of a way of saying the limit doesn't exist, but you know what the graph does do? It goes up. But that's for another another time. Okay, for this guy, x approaches 1. We've got to find our x value. This is our x value. As I come from the left, I get, clo I get closer and closer and closer to a y value up. And from the right, 0. Here, approaches zero, we're coming in from the right, we're coming in from the left, we're getting close to one. Right. How is that? Did you know that much about this? No. Okay. Before you got here, did you do that much? No. After, after, after. Now I know. Refresh your memory to teach you something new. Copy something. Copy something. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that one. Do you guys find derivatives? No. We did. We did like all the limits and derivatives stuff like the last day or two. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, that's what calculus is for. We're here to look at limits. We're here to find derivatives. We're here to find a lot of other things. Okay. All right. So. Here we go. Now let's look at a. Um, well, we've seen a few functions that don't have limits, right? At, at certain values, of course. They have limits all other places, right? Does this have a limit as x approaches? Well, let's, let's go to this one. Does it have a limit as x approaches 2? Yeah. Let's go down here. Why not? Yeah, we're at x equals 2. It just, it, you know, it's getting closer and closer to I'm not sure. Negative. Yeah, it's negative 1 ish. Let's see, can we put it, we can put two in here, two over two minus three, that's two over negative one, so yeah, it goes to negative two, it's two to find, it's even easier to find the limit, okay, that would be the way we try to find limits, is get it so that we can plug the number in, so it's no longer an issue, okay. um, let's look at a function that's really, really weird, okay, let's talk about f of x, the sine of 1 over x. Any you calculators? If you don't, go we'll grab a calculator. Check it out. Sine is Wow. And you tell me, does the limit as x approaches 0 1 over x exists, and if it does, what is it? No. Just come up with no. You gotta have, have some argument. If it doesn't exist, it doesn't. Why? Um, <laughs> well, I'm looking. 
looking at the graph right now, and one's going down here, so that would be going to like that kind of number, a negative number, and then this one would be going to a different y value if you went. Like, I mean, there is nothing at zero, it looks like. Okay, well, that's what yours looks like. Okay. All right. Exploration oh. time is over, and let's just. Oh, yeah. no. Um. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. it does this. Yeah. Uh, what would function be? Uh, oh, I want to be in radian. That was my problem. Okay, we look at the graph. And the graph looks like that. Think about this function. Okay? Don't remember your trig. Study up on your trig. Right. You don't have to be like super genius as a trig, but you should know the basics about a trig. What a sine is, what cosine is, and what kind of numbers you can get from sine. What's the biggest value you can get out of this function? One. And what's the smallest? Negative one. Negative. You guys remember that? You get your yeah. unit circles out. Look at it. You go around the unit circle. The biggest sign we have is here. That's a sign of one. And down here, sign of negative one. Sign of pi over two. Or any other angle that is coterminal with pi over two is one. And sign of three pi over two. Terminal is negative one. No matter how big, huge, ginormous an angle you think about, a big angle is just around and around and around and around, and around a bunch of times and then stop somewhere and then if you want to know what the sign is, take a look at what the sign is. The biggest one you can expect is one, the smallest one you can expect is negative one. So let's look at the graph. That's not surprising. Right? What do we see there? Kind of tops out at one and well, I can't see it very well. Let me zoom in on it. Um, I can use a box, just draw a box around it. So moving this cursor around the screen, this is what it was like to use the Inspire. Like, to move a cursor around the screen. Okay, so now I get a better look at it. The biggest value I get is one, the smallest value I get is negative one. What am I looking for? A limit, right? It, it seems like, it certainly seems like at some point uh, I'm gonna like this right side of the graph is gonna like come down or it's gonna come up towards the other side of the graph, which is also coming, you know, at the same. So figure it out. What is or, or come up with a good argument why you think it doesn't exist, other than uh, kind of trace things. Okay, but we've talked about how graphs can have holes in them. So definitely you can't put zero into this function because one over zero is undefined. Okay, but if I'm looking at the limit, what, what could I do to figure out what it's getting close to? What y value is getting close to? Zoom in even further. Zoom in further, okay. Zoom in further, let's try that. So I'm gonna use box so that I keep the same the horizontal the same. But I'm going to zoom in on this really narrow piece of the graph. Just barely to the left, barely to the right. Okay? My box is just like barely to the left of the y axis and barely to the right. One pixel to the left, one pixel to the right. So it's really stretching this guy out. Okay, I can zoom in again and again and again, but it looks like it's on such a small scale, it's gonna be hard to tell, right? It's hard to tell what value it's getting close to. Let's use something, some other tool on our calculator to figure out what y values we get as we approach zero. What can, what can we use to figure out what y values we're getting close to as we approach zero? The number of tables to zero for x. For the number, how do we put numbers in for x and have the calculator what tells, tells what y? Table. Any other ways? List. Trace. List is for statistics. 
this is the way we did the, uh, the ball experiment. Um, so, okay, I heard table. So I've heard before. So let's put something in that's close to zero. What's close to zero on the right? 0 0.01. 0.01, that's certainly very close to zero on the right side. Okay, negative 0 0.5064. So, maybe we're getting close to like a negative half, right? Negative 0.5064. So if I get even close to zero, if the limit is negative one half, I should see a number that is even close to, closer to negative one half, right? Let's try it. What's closer to zero than point zero one? Okay, let's do this. Okay, forget negative half. Okay, it's not getting close to negative half. Maybe it's getting close to point zero three six. I don't know. Maybe it's getting close to that. Okay, let's put our hopes on point zero three six and get it to be closer to zero on the x and see a y that is closer to 0 0.036. So put control zero and then it's an error. Yeah. Why is that? Because we got so close. Huh? Calculators are not perfect. They are finite things, and we're talking about infinitely close to zero, right? It can't get infinitely close. It can't go infinitely far. It's just a calculator. So some numbers are too big and too small. There's limits on it. And now I'm just like, I'm perplexed. Uh, now it looks like it's getting close to negative half again. It keeps going. Yeah. Oscillating. Oscillating, yeah, that's the word for going back and forth, up and down, oscillation, right? Oscillation. And how many oscillations do you think we'll see as we approach zero? Four An infinite number of oscillations. And that's the explanation for why this doesn't have a limit, because we have infinite oscillations. I mean, forget trying to get the same value on the right and the left, I can't even get the right to settle down. The right just keeps going back and forth. Can somebody explain to me and everybody else why that's happening to this function? Why are we just going back and forth? It's a sine function, so it can only exist between one and negative one. So the only values I can get out of it, right? So it's like a shoot out to infinity and negative one. What kind of numbers are we plugging in for x? Positive. How else would you characterize these numbers? Um, well, we're decimals. Putting decimals. Less than one. Less than one. In fact, very, very tiny. When we say very, very tiny, we usually mean close to zero, right? Mm -hmm. Even in the negative world, we usually mean close to zero. Even though technically a small negative number is just really, really negative. Um, so we put in things like 0 0.01 and 0 0.00001. What happens when I take 1 and divide it by 0 0.00001? It gets a big number. It gets a big number. It gets a very large number, right? Essentially what we're doing is, is 0 0.001 is like 1 over 1,000, right? 1 over 1 over 1,000 would be 1,000, right? So what I'm asking it to do when I put in 0 0.001 is take the sine of 1,000 radians. That's a lot of radians. How many radians approximately is it all the way around once? Two. Two six pi. Two pi, and how big is two pi? Six point something? Six point two eight, three point one four for one pi, six point two eight for two pi. So that's six point two eight radians. We're talking about a thousand radians. This is a long time. It's taking a long time. I don't know if I could do it that many times before class was over. Um, so yeah, that's what's happening. We're, we're just getting a bigger and bigger value in for the sine as we put a, a number that's closer to zero. We're just going to keep oscillating back and forth, back and forth between one and negative one. And we're never, ever going to approach anything, uh, you know, singular. We're not going to approach any one value. It's almost like a, it's not, but it's almost like just a random number picker. You put in a really small number, and it's just going to give you back with like some number between one and negative one. Of course, we can know what it is because every angle has a sign down. Um, yeah. So you see what's happening there? The reason why we don't have a limit is because they cannot possibly approach the same value on the right and the left because even the right by itself can't approach one value. Let alone try to get left to agree to that. It just keeps going back and forth. Okay. So there we go. Infinite oscillation. So if we look at number 17. Does that look familiar? Yeah. yeah. All right, it's going back and forth, back and forth. And cosine has the same issue. I put in one over.
or a small number. It's really a big number. Once it have a big number, it's just some number between one and negative one. And we'll just keep going back and forth forever now. Okay? Let's take a look at this one, this last one, 18 tangent of x, the limit as x approaches pi over 2 of tangent of x. can't even get to the same infinity. We're going in different directions. If we did approach the same infinity, kind of, I guess depending on who you ask, you could say, well, if they're both going up, then uh, let's say the limit is infinity. But that's really a way of saying the limit doesn't exist because it's just no number that it gets close to. That's what the limit is. Okay. So what I'd like you to do is uh, you should have gotten that remind message. Yeah, with the homework? Yeah. You got that. So I want you to work on 1.2. 1.2. thing about this function up here, we're finding that every everything we put into it gives us the same thing as if we put in the same x here. So when that's true, when these things match up for every other value except for the one you're trying to find the limit at, uh, you can just use this other function. By the way, just a side note. If I want to find the limit as x approaches 4 of x plus 2, how do you think I might do that? Do I need to put in numbers that are close to 4 on the right and then close to 4 on the left and see if they're approaching the same thing? Not for that one. Why not for that one? It's a relative. So it's, a it's, yeah, it's a line, right? There's no trickiness here. There's no breaks. There's no holes. There's no weirdness, right? Just plug 4 in there and you get 6. What do you think? It's a line. You plug in four and you get six. On the right, do you think it's getting close to six? On the left, do you think it's getting close to six? Yeah. So there are these, call them uh, nice, uh, cooperative functions, continuous functions, right? At least ones that are continuous where we're looking for the limit. If that's true, if it's continuous there, meaning it doesn't have any holes and it doesn't have any breaks, then we can just plug the number right in there. We can do it by direct substitution. That would be a bolded term, direct substitution. Right? The problem here is we can't do direct substitution for this one if we want to do the limit as x approaches 4 of g of x. That's not going to work. So we are going to first start with the dividing out. If you can find another function that's just like this function minus the whole, then you can just use it to find the limit. By plugging the number in. Okay? So, how do we do that? Factor the quadratic. Hey. I didn't even get to rewrite this before somebody suggested factoring the quadratic. The limit as x approaches 4 of, okay, let's factor that quadratic. How does it factor? x plus 2, x minus 4. So if I put in 7, 7 plus 2 is 9, 7 minus 4 is 3, so that's 7 times 3, and then we have a 3 down here, 3 divides 3, and it's 3 divides 3, and we cancel out the 3. Try with any number except 4, and it's just a common factor. 
that's exactly what it is. It's a factor of this quadratic. It's a common factor between the numerator and the denominator. We can cancel it out. All right. So that leaves x plus 2. Well, that's not a big surprise, right? We kind of have to realize that these are very closely related functions. All right. So here's the thing, this technical thing that I really want to get through to you. I can do that. I can just cross out x minus 4 and x minus 4. As long as I'm talking about the limits. Once I erase the limits, well, I won't erase the limit, but is x plus 2 the function equal to x plus 2 <laughs> times x minus 4 over x minus 4? Are those two things equal to each other? Yeah. They are not. For one tiny, tiny reason. And what tiny, tiny reason is that? There's a hole in this one at 4, and there is not a hole in this one at 4. So the functions are not equal to each other. But think about their limits. Their limits are all equal to each other, right? When I'm looking at from the right and the left, what am I getting close to? A hole doesn't have an issue, right? If there's a hole on a graph, I can get close to it. Even if I'm just on the other side, like if this is the limit at, at 4, what about the limit at 3.9999999? Does that exist? Yeah. It does. Even though just to the right there's a hole, there's also an infinite number of numbers between 3.999999 and 4 that we can look at and coming from the right side of 3.999999. Right? Just throw in 17 more nines. You're not to 4 yet, so you're not like standing in the hole having an issue. You're still coming from the right, and you can still come from the left, and so all the limits are still possible. So when we're talking about limits, not about functions, I can't just cross this x minus 4 and this x minus 4 and say that this function is the same as that function. This one has a hole and that one doesn't. That's what makes them different. It's a really tiny difference, but it is a difference. But their limits are the same. And once I can do this, once I can cross out a common factor, I can just say, well, this is the same as the limit as x approaches 4 of this simpler function. And just plug in 4 and find out that the limit is 6. So this is 6. six. Right. So let me throw one your way. And the same kind of thing. It's fine. Um, This is factorable how? Difference of squares. Great. So x plus 1 times x minus 1, right? And x plus 1 here, x plus 1, x plus 1 cancel. You can only really cancel those because we're looking at limits. If we're looking at functions, we're committing a no-no, but we're okay now. So now we have a new function, x minus 1, and if you move in the direction of your homework, it says to find a simpler function. That's what it's talking about here. It's a function that agrees at all but one point. What point? Does this function not agree with this function? Negative. At negative one, they don't agree. Okay, so what is this limit? Negative two, because now we can plug in negative one in, no problem. Okay. Um, I mean, whatever you can do, I mean, mostly it's going to be factoring. Uh, polynomials in some way, shape, or form. You know, factor polynomials, what are the factors of this polynomial, we can't factor factor this polynomial, and your problems are solved. Okay. Let's take a look at something like this. Another strategy for finding limits, a skill we want to have, so we've been forgotten. Um, this is 54, it's not your homework, so leave it in your notes if you want. X approaches 0 of the square root of 2 plus x minus the square root of 2 over x. Of 
First, let's talk about why it's an issue. Okay, and that's going to be tricky. What do you do when it gets to an imaginary number? Uh, that would be an issue except for, well, it won't be to us. Oh. We're not trying to put a number oh, that would cause it to yeah, happen. Oh, yeah, I just right? saw the negative. But that would be an issue. That would cause it undefined. But as long as x isn't uh, negative, bigger, like, more negative than negative 2, then we will be fine. And we're talking about 0, so we're going to be alright. Uh, otherwise, it's a, a fine function. But when I try to do direct substitution, how do I know that's not going to work? How do I know I can't find the limit that way yet? Is zero in the denominator. Zero in the denominator. In fact, you get zero in the numerator. Right? Which is good. You want to get zero in the numerator and denominator. If you didn't, you'd have a, a vertical asymptote. There would be no hope of finding the limit there. You want to hold, which is when you get zero in the numerator and denominator at the same time. Okay. So we get a zero in the denominator, and this is bad. So taking a cue from the stuff we've already done, what are we hoping to do to that x? Cancel. Cancel, right? Get a factor of x in the numerator, get a cancel out. All right, so let me just throw out a suggestion that you probably wouldn't think of uh, just to guess it, OK? Um, let me just show you this real quick. a plus b times a minus b. What are these two things called? What are their relationships to each other? There's a special name. Well, it would multiply two different yeah. squares. Such as the c. J conjugates. conjugates. These are conjugates. When you multiply conjugates, it's like a difference of squares. Watch what happens. A squared plus uh, a b minus a b minus b squared cancels out a squared minus b squared. So, uh, no, not a minus, not a squared. But what if I multiply this by its own conjugate? Well. Then this first thing will square, you know, it will multiply by itself. The second thing will be multiplied by, excuse me, by itself, which is great news for square roots because you multiply square root by itself. Cancellation. Also, the middle terms are going to be canceled out. Let's multiply the denominator by the same thing because, of course, that's what we have to do. We're going to just throw stuff in there. Oh, this should be a plus. So we're taking the limit as x approaches 0 of the denominator is x times square root of 2 plus x plus square root of 2. In the numerator, what do we get? We can, we can just follow this pattern here. We can multiply it out and realize the middle thing is canceled. We're going to get square root of 2 plus x times square root of 2 plus x. What's that? 2 plus x. 2 plus x. Uh, and then we're going to have square root of 2 plus x times positive square root of 2. 2 plus x times negative square root of 2. Those are the exact opposite things that cancel each other out. Negative square root of 2 times positive square root of 2. Negative 2. Negative 2. What happens? <coughs> minus 2 goes away. x divided by x is 1. Right? 2 and minus 2 is gone. And now we have x divided by x is 1. And so the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over the square root of 2 plus x plus square root of 2. We had an issue when we came up here. We plug 0 in, we get 0 in the denominator. Let's see if we get the same issue here. Do we? We don't. We get 0 there. You get square root of 2, square root of 2, 1 over square root of 2 plus square root of 2. Wait. Square root of 2 plus the square root of 2? That's square root of 2 times square root of 2. Two roots. There's two of them. And of course, uh, we have root two over four. What happens if the x is in the of zero? Yes. Okay. We rationalize the denominator. There we go. One more quick. this somewhere in your studies. So if I multiply this by, uh, whatever. Well, those are conjugates, right? Let's see what happens when I multiply these together. 2 squared 
We get one times cosine and one times negative cosine and one times positive cosine. They're going to cancel. We're going to get minus cosine squared. Does this look familiar? Pythagorean Pythagorean identity. There's a sine squared plus a cosine squared equals one. If we cut cosine squared from both sides, we get one minus cosine squared equals sine squared. Okay. So just like this one back here, did a nice thing in, in kind of clearing up the square roots and, and cleaning up that factor of x. Perhaps you see something like one plus cosine x or one plus, plus, plus sine x. And you multiply it by the conjugate, and then we get one squares of, ten of, of, uh, of trigonometric functions, and maybe there's a, a Pythagorean identity that we can deal with, right? So think about that. Think about multiplying by conjugates in the numerator and denominator. Um, but otherwise, it's plugging numbers into charts a little bit. Some of it is plug numbers into charts and find a simpler function that agrees at an ultimate point, and then it goes into just find a limit. And it's up to you to figure out how to get that problem factor to cancel out. That is all. The bell is going to today.